Good morning. It's my pleasure to um, to get us uh, started here by uh, introducing the first speaker for today's uh, symposium. My name is Michelle Hogue, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Randy Wittes. Uh, Dr. Wittes is professor at the University of Regina, where he's taught uh, courses in the Department of Geography since 1986. He's published widely in the field of historical geography, in the history and geography of the Prairie West, and importantly, in the historical geography of the Canadian-U.S. borderlands. His talk today draws on that expertise, and an expertise that's manifest in his uh, monographs, in his edited volumes, articles, book chapters, and conference publications that stretch back many, many decades, in fact, stretch back uh, long before um, the scholarly interest in the U.S.-Canada borderlands uh, emerged in its current form or became so um, so, so dominant and so um, so present in the academic landscape. And he, he's here today to draw on that experience and to talk about the mutability and immutability of borders in the face of the history of globalization. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wittes. Thank you, Michelle, for reminding me how old I am. <laughs> and I want to thank Victor and, uh, and Carleton University for hosting this symposium. And thank you for coming out this early hour. So let's get this party started. All right, borders are immutable. They're always in motion. They're constantly reimagined, contested, and reconstructed through time and space. But borders are also immutable. They never go away. And because border immutability and immutability work at all scales, the challenge is to develop border policy that reflects this understanding. Until recently, this border paradox was increasingly overlooked as we were told that globalization was leading the world in a direction towards greater homogeneity and unified culture, an argument that by its very nature diminishes the relevance of the nation state and by implication the importance of history and geography, and minimizes the significance of borders. Nevertheless, as we all know, recent history has demonstrated that territories and therefore borders, both formal and cultural, still matter. This presentation reflects upon the mutability and immutability of borders in the face of the history of globalization. It attempts to unravel the entanglements that connect globalization and borders, and in doing so, reflects on the strings that connect the past and present, and to identify and analyze the roles that such connections play in the ever-changing world of borders, borderlands, and bordering. It focuses on the challenges facing historical research and concludes with some reflection on what all this means for policy making. I've always been intrigued by the U.S.-Canada relationship, and this was an interest that was given some direction when I, when I discovered the border as mirror metaphor. Margaret Atwood, the great Canadian novelist, writes that the U.S.-Canada border is the longest one-way mirror in the world. The argument is that while Canadians look closely at Americans trying to make sense of their every move, Americans only see their reflection when and if they look at Canada. Jody Berlin writes, the Canadian hides behind verisimilitude, passing as the other, while rec recognizing the other as not oneself. This vantage point is double reflected through a one-way mirror in which America does not see Canada at all. The root of the mirror metaphor lies with Harold Innes, who argues, in using other mirrors, uh, cultures as mirrors in which we may see our own culture, we are affected by the stigma of our own eyesight and the defects of the mirror with the result that we are apt to see nothing in other cultures but the virtues of our own. As a generalization for many Canadians, particularly Anglophone Canadians, our relationship with the United States has played a major part in developing our national symbols. While the border is a mirror for Americans, America itself, rather than the U.S.-Canada border, is Canada's mirror. By looking past the border and examining the nature of America and our relationships with it, most Canadians, as I do, see themselves. So I'm arguing that the U.S. is not external to Canada's national identity, rather it's important, it's an integral part of it. In my first book, I dared to offer some reflection on the act of crossing the border in order to open a discussion on the conceptual level of the relationship between national boundaries and Canadian identity. By this time, I come to realize that a transnational approach which looks beyond political boundaries and is more attuned to the contingent nature of nation states and regions is just as important as the traditional historical approach that focuses on national narratives. 
We need to view the larger topic of the Canadian-American relations from a perspective that avoids what John Agnew has termed the territorial trap and Donna Gabacha has labeled the tyranny of the national. But there was one event that triggered an epiphany of sorts, and that was the debate between Victor Conrad and Cole Harris over the Borland thesis at the 1990 AAG meetings, fittingly, in Toronto. This debate, combined with extensive reading, made me realize that Canada's collective biography since 1784 has had one consistent theme addressed in each of its chapters, and that is its relationship with the United States. To a much lesser but certainly not insignificant degree, the same may be said for the U.S. I came to recognize that the most important contribution of the borderlands concept to an understanding of the historical geography of Canadian-American relations is that it returns the symbol of the border to the fact of place. So borders must be viewed in relation to the borderlands in which they are situated. Now there are many challenges that I faced and face all historical borderland scholars, some of which I will now review. Until recently, the transnational approach in the field of borderlands history occupied a marginal position in scholarship, as historians operated largely within the confines of their respective nation states. This is particularly the case for the U.S. and Canada, two countries with many similarities but some profound differences as well, for example in the case of founding myths. The United States is argued to be a product of revolution created by rebels who wanted to limit the role of government and for whom the only inalienable entitlement was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Drawing their inspiration from the Enlightenment and religion, the revolutionary saw America as a shining example for the rest of the world, a new Jerusalem, a city upon the hill, to use John Winthrop's metaphor as John F. Kennedy did. America was in some sense the antithesis of what was wrong with the old world, Europe. And this American sense of mission is therefore inseparable from the founding of the U.S. as a nation. Individualism and opportunity were to be the hallmarks of this new society, and a strong commitment to individualism continues to be the most common symbol of American self-reliance and self-definition. The lone cowboy silhouetted against the western sky, an image mythologized in literature and films, transcends uh, the significant cultural heterogeneity that characterizes the makeup of American society and reinforces a historical sense of exceptionalism that continues to exist even in this age of globalization. A cynic might argue that often myth informs American politics more than history. I'm not saying I'm a cynic. In Canada, the break with the rejection of Europe did not take place, at least not to the same extent. The immigrants' arrival in North America represented not the rejection of Europe, but an affirmation of many of Europe's values. Canada, it is argued, it was created by a process of evolution, its constitution emphasizing peace, order, and good government. Change occurred more as a result of negotiation and constitutional reform than by revolution. Now, when it first appeared, transnationalism was not well received by historical and geographical schools in this country, who feared that such an approach was just a new version of the old continentalist framework. Following the arguments of Innocent Creighton, the historical geographer Cole Harris maintained that the emergence of Canadian regions, regional identities, and even a national consciousness had more to do with the east-west transcontinental expansion of trade and settlement than proximity to American regions, and that regional borders in Canada are more the result of distinctive European encounters with different Canadian settings than simply being peripheries of American core regions. He and others criticized Borland scholars for being too ready to deconstruct national narratives. Nevertheless, to a significant degree, there has occurred a shift in the focus from a nation-state-based lens to a transnational lens. The shift reflects the impact of globalization, postmodernism, and conceptions of post-national studies. This resulted in part from the cultural turn, a movement dedicated to the goal of making culture the focus of contemporary debates. This lens, uh, the cultural turn lends itself to questioning uh, traditional concepts of place, space, and nation, and of their relationships with culture. It offers perspectives on the connections between the global and the local. It's more sensitive to a certain countries' quest for empire. And it seeks to study the confluences and divergences of social, economic, and cultural exchanges between countries. However, Canadian and American historians continue to work primarily on topics relevant within the borders of their own nation states. 
And as Pekka Hamelin and Samuel Truitt point out, the field of borderlands history is still characterized by unsettled centrist paradigms that continues to preserve long established distinctions between imperial and national histories, immigrant and indigenous subjects, and state and non-state realms. In Canada, I argue there needs to be a corrective to the prevailing nationalist exegesis, one that does not reject outright the relevance of the east-west axis, but balances this perspective with one that recognizes the north-south links that played such a crucial role in the evolution of Canadian society. In the US, there needs to be a corrective to the dominant exceptionalist exegesis, one that does not ignore nation-centered topics, but balances this approach with another that recognizes the importance of transnational forces that transcend borders. I think there's merit in looking at North America sideways, because such an angle generates a perspective that adds greatly to the understanding of each nation state. Second challenge, history is messy. It's not a collection of facts on which everyone can agree. It's a collection of scholars exchanging different, often conflicting analyses. The most significant questions are often difficult to answer because of the lack of sources. We are slaves to our documents. Borderlands history is particularly hard to do. It's not a single history divided from other histories by national borders, but it is rather an amalgam of two or more histories. It's a study of entanglements, not linear narratives or detachments resulting from the border, or from the, uh, border problem of theme selection. The big themes that we emphasize are globalization, sovereignty, indigeneity, migration flows, and the evolution of borderlands. In making this case for bringing history back into border studies, Liam O'Dowd maintains that contemporary work minimizes the primacy of state borders because they fail to acknowledge historical reflexivity, the historical position or context that's so important in understanding the distinctiveness of contemporary state borders and how they differ from other borders. The legacy of the past reverberates right through to the present. Borders are historically contingent. They evolve through processes of border making or bordering and therefore the meanings connected to them are constantly changing along with political, economic and social developments taking place, place both externally between and internally within states. Borders mediate, regulate and represent processes associated with globalization, processes that are both universal and historically and geographically specific. Like borders, borderlands also must be situated in their temporal and geographical context in order to investigate the relations between territory, identity, and sovereignty. While a borderland is primarily a territorial concept, the temporal factor is of fundamental importance in defining its role as a place. As borderlands change, so do their capacity to re-territorialize and rescale place and identity. Borderlands can expand to become significant regions and narrow to become not much more than lines, depending on historical circumstances, including those associated with various stages of globalization. The emphasis on the modern ignores the fact that globalization in varied forms has existed for centuries. But there is a growing interest in exploring the nature of transnational pro processes during periods, previous periods of globalization and deglobalization. The conundrum of theory. While the expansion of border and borderland studies into a broad interdisciplinary field has given rise to new combinations and approaches, there still exists uncertainty to the role of theory. Despite the fact that an increasing inter interdisciplinary focus has resulted in the widening of the ontology and epistemology of borders and borderlands, it appears ever more obvious that no one theory or approach can adequately address the increasing range of interests and questions that characterize this growing field. Ansi Passy argues that the variegated nature of borders and with their own contextual features, power relations and unique histories make the development of a general theory virtually impossible. The distinctions between disciplines in terms of their epistemologies make it even more difficult for scholars to engage in meaningful dialogue and cooperative research. Historians have contributed significantly to the methodology of the field, asking questions about the origin, nature, and consequences of borders, and therefore adding much to our understanding of borders as constructed, contested, and reconstructed entities. But their traditional resistance to constructing grand theories has encumbered, to some extent, an engagement with theory. There exists only a handful of works 
that has attempted to construct theory which stands in contrast to the humanities and cultural studies where border theory has had a major impact. Historians tend to place more weight on empirical studies. Those who do try to develop theory uh, seem to adopt the stage model as a paradigmatic strategy. And, and, but there are some uh, issues with this. While these models and their constituent typologies are useful in the analysis of different layers of time and the evolution of borders, the, their complexity and uniqueness of historical events ensures that stages and types are never found in their pure form. It may be the case that certain borderlands at different times in their evolution do not fit into the stages identified in the models, or that they exist somewhere in between them. Stage models also overemphasize discontinuity. The focus perhaps should be more on transitions rather than the stages themselves. While there is value in attempting to develop theories, concepts and approaches that transcend disciplinary boundaries and provide a common frame of reference, the concept of borderlands remains under-theorized. But this is changing as borderland scholars adopt postmodern and or post-structuralist arguments in the tradition of Foucault and Derrida. Like others, I argue that historical research can benefit from the study of contemporary border and borderlands because researchers engaged in the latter have been generally more active and successful in conceptualizing and theorizing borders and borderlands than those engaged in the former. There are some examples of this. Influenced by post-colonial theory and Victor Turner's concept of liminality, Gloria Anzaldúa's uh, and Zodua offers an argument that reframes the border as a theory of liminality and hybridity. She argues that, the, that uh, the lifeblood of two worlds merged to form a third, a border culture. Land on either side of a border exists in a liminal condition. It has many of the traits of both regions and yet is different because of the hybridization resulting from the merging of two regions within a specific space. Homi Baba are, defines a third space, which is as a present time in a specific space, which constitutes the discursive conditions of enunciation that ensure that the meaning and symbols of culture have no primordial unity or fixity, that even the same signs can be appropriated, translated, rehistoricized, and read anew. The third space is an in, in, uh, interrogatory, interstitial space, which counters a historicism and presents a linear narrative of the nation. Anzo Dua's Borderlands and Baba's Third Space, as well as, as, well as Michel Foucault's Heterotopias, uh, and other concepts as well, make us think about those spaces where different cultures and ideologies come into contact. This reflection certainly underlies recent work by Borderland historians, including the work of Michel here. Who, who focus on hybrid spaces characterized by mobility, situational identity, local contingency, and the ambiguities of power. Hamlet and Truett say that, argue that borderland historians have finally begun to rewrite North American history as a history of entanglements, of shifting accommodations, rather than one of expansion. Yet the entanglements they study, for the most part, are those of a more distant past, of places and times far removed from the borderlands of today. While there's still a need to study frontiers and borderlands during the pre-contact and colonial periods, we must not limit our investigations to places and periods far removed from present-day borderlands. So we have to try to construct conceptual bridges that connect the borderlands of the more distant past with those of today. But what kind of building materials should we use? That's the question that I ask. So I, I, I've attempted to build such a bridge. I point postmodernism, space-time compression, and the deterritorialization, re-territorialization, paradox of globalization as the foundations upon which I build the syntax of what I call a spatial grammar frame. Victor Conrad and Heather Nickel argue that much of the work in Borderlands has benefited from a postmodern point of view, an argument that runs counter to the postmodernist contention that globalization threatens the particularity of places, borders, and territoriality. Many argue that postmodernism's emphasis on hybridity makes the notion of boundaries obsolete, an idea which leads to the conclusion that the nation state has become irrelevant. Postmodernists also question the representation of history and cultural identities and challenge the traditional belief that it's possible to establish the truth about the past. So what can postmodernism offer to any historical study of borderland evolution? 
Well, here's my answer. Well, postmodernists see history as an artificial construction and question historians' claims to historical truth, postmodernism doesn't necessarily point to the disappearance of history, only to more complicated ways of grasping the past. History is essential to postmodernism because postmodernism seems to understand itself as a historical condition through theoretical means. While postmodernists talk about the end of the nation state and a borderless world, their emphasis on culture and identity has paradoxically stimulated a rethinking of borders, borderlands, and transnationalism. Despite their arguments for the abandonment of conventional concepts such as center, periphery, and hierarchy, postmodernists support alternative concepts including flows and nodes and networks that serve as useful tools to help us see, think, and speak about borderland processes and landscapes. These are a couple maps that I've made that show flows of investment and in people across the Canada-US border in the Great Lakes borderland. Post, the postmodern uh, suspicion of the meta narrative has reinforced an approach to borders and borderlands that is sensitive to regional and local differences, and the idea that borderland identities are multi layered and responsive to scale. The postmodern perspective lends itself to a view of the borderland as a liminal geographical space, historical time, a place of ambiguity and indeterminacy that is constantly in a state of evolution. The postmodern lens raises questions regarding borders' functions in terms of ordering, othering, and interactions. Its emphasis on difference in case studies also implies that, are, that there exist separate practices and experiences of bordering. Space-time compression is a concept used by geographers when considering how societies have used transportation and communication technologies to reduce the friction of distance and facilitate the interaction among places. David Harvey argues that the process of annihilation of space through time has always lain at the center of capitalism's dynamic. While space and time adjusting technologies have existed for centuries, the nature, impact, and pace of these technologies have rapidly accelerated during the transition to modernity and postmodernity. Space still matters. Technology may reduce the friction of distance, but it doesn't place us all into one location. There are many kinds of spaces, just as there are multiple distances, and they all differ according to scale, and because differences exist in space, space cannot be annihilated by time. While time has been compressed, space has been extended as well as condensed, at least for those who live in circumstances where it is more likely they can take advantage of such technologies. The radically changing space times of postmodernity now make it much easier for individuals, businesses, and communities to interact simultaneously, thus unbounding flows and networks, and consequently cha challenging territoriality and the coherence of national units, and changing the functions of borders. The new postmodern spatialities and temporalities produce unequal effects that are manifested in space and experienced in different ways by borderlands, which vary in terms of history and geography. Here I draw attention to Doreen Massey's uh, power geometry of space-time compression, a phrase she uses to examine the different ways in which groups and individuals are inserted into space and time, assisted or hampered by the ways that they are, they are constantly being reconfigured through the dynamics of capitalist development and its associated technologies. To this list I would add communities and regions because they differ as to where they fit into the new world order and consequently embody different power geometries. As many scholars have noted, while postmodern processes of deterritorialization caused by globalization are felt everywhere, so are re-territorializing forces which attempt to cope with the impacts of globalization. Recently, forces of re-territorialization have once again reconfigured the Canada-US borderlands. Various cross-border cooperation schemes have been implemented that redefine and extend traditional connections and develop new economic linkages and cross-border governances that on one hand recognize state sovereignty, but on the other hand understand the greater need for communities and regions to cooperate with their counterparts along and across common borders in the face of increasing global competition. Penmoir is a good example of that. The devolution of some powers to and the support of transnational regions, along with the greater support for cross-border cooperation, is evidence that governments, federal, state, provincial, and municipal, and business groups recognize that the border territorial state is struggling to meet the requirements of a world of flows and networks 
and that a new kind of spatial fix recognizing other types of territorial organizations is needed. Yet while the spatial fix of the postmodern era may mean that the nation state may be giving up some traditional powers of control, it's not dying. The state will continue to direct development, manage networks, and interpret and provide essential context for the new political, economic, and cultural realities of globalization. The 2016 election of Donald Trump and his attempts to reintroduce protectionism is evidence of the power of the state and the inevitability of borders. A historical perspective recognizes the importance of the relationship between borderland evolution and the changing forces of globalization. Brief history. The national governments during the first half of the 19th century were generally protective, but the implementation of lazy fair trade policies following the repeal of the Corn Laws resulted in a rapid internationalization of the world economy, which continued to evolve even after the U.S. led the movement back to more protective regimes during the last two decades of the century. Sound familiar? The resulting integration of world, of world regions via large-scale immigration, trade, and capital mobility prompted some to believe that a rudimentary form of globalization was at work. To a considerable degree, borderlands were at the forefront of these developments. Over the course of the 20th century, Canada and the U.S. developed an increasingly interdependent but asymmetrical relationship. The relationship became more complex and, it, and interdependent over time as immense changes in political, economic, and social structures intertwined with technological developments served to transform societies and borderlands. The, and, and so what were some of these changes? The spread of industrial capitalism and the growth of the multinational corporation, the rise of imperialism in variant forms leading to further global conflict and regional disputes, massive population inc increases and rapid urbanization, the development of technologies that compress space and time, decolonization, the questioning of ideas of, of progress and cultural change, social revolution, the adoption of Keynesian economic policies followed by the shift towards neoliberal strategies that privilege the market and facilitate the flow of capital and goods, the resurgence of nationalism and regionalism in the face of an accelerated globalization all occurred during this period. Developments associated with globalization significantly impacted the Canadian-American relationship and served to reconfigure the various borderland regions shared by both countries. As globalization in the late and post stages of modernity produced unprecedented flows and mobilities that transcended borders of all kinds, the nature of the relationship between the U.S. and Canada changed. By the end of the 20th century, marked particularly by the enactment of free trade, many began to emphasize the permeability, fluidity, and flexibility of the Canadian-American border and to question its ontological status. While there are strong arguments supporting the position that globalization has compromised the existence of nation states and as such served to reconfigure borderlands, there are also formidable grounds supporting the view that nation states, at least the more powerful ones, still have the means by which they can control the responses to globalization. Nation states develop regulatory frameworks that both enable and limit transborder flows of capital and goods. Neoliberalism requires the nation state to establish the conditions necessary to implement neoliberal policies. While neoliberalism promotes the extension of markets and criticizes collectivist strategies, it is neither monolithic in form nor universal in effect. It exists in historically and geographically contingent forms and so can be interpreted and acted upon in different ways. Recent events have demonstrated that borders and bordering practices are currently undergoing substantive changes amid the incongruous processes of globalization and resurging protectionism. As neoliberalist globalization has disrupted societies through elitism, speculation, and monopolization, collective counter-movements have emerged that have different political orientations. Such reactions tend to adhere to the more extreme poles of the ideological continuum, surfacing either as support for socialism or the current populist-based anti-neoliberalism that lay at the foundation of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. Although it's unlikely that Keynesian economics will return at any time soon, there might occur a reconfiguration of the current world order and a re-emergence of tariffs and nation-to-nation -nation trade deals. Such developments have already taken place with the actions taken by the Trump government against China and other nations.
The knowledge of history and its inevitable cycles makes us contemplative of such possibilities. A historical perspective helps us realize that all borderlands are paradoxical. Finally, the discussion of borderlands has ignored the place of Indigenous peoples, although this is changing, and Michel's excellent book on the Métis and the Medicine Line is an example of that. For Native peoples throughout all the Canada-U.S. borderlands, the superimposed geopolitical border bears economic, social, cultural, and psychological consequences. The borders that define traditional Native spaces were never geopolitical lines. They were conceptions about flows and changes in the natural environment. The only boundaries that really mattered were those that mediated between groups and their environments. Thresholds were established that facilitated the human-environment relationship. They served to reinforce sustainability, and if they were crossed, an imbalance would occur, thus threatening the existence of both the group and the environment. Non-native borders and treaties interrupted this dynamism, circumventing and constricting native spatial interpretations of their natural surroundings, although for some time certain groups took advantage of the border to strengthen their relative position within a fur trade borderland. Eventually, the processes of bordering served to restrict their rights and place them into a position of subservience and dependence. Border enforcement challenges indigenous geographies that are based on motion, fluidity, and adaptation to changes that occur in the natural world. The story of indigenous borderlands is a narrative exploring how native groups have developed strategies to adapt to changing conditions that in many ways have threatened their existence and to reestablish and exercise sovereignty that will place them in a much stronger position to make their case. While this is a story shared by all native peoples, regardless of location, the story will play out differently in the borderlands where groups on both sides of the border have the potential to establish connections that will better serve their mutual goals. Conclusion. Borderlands history, which recognizes that borders are often areas of dispute, ambiguity, and cultural mixing, is particularly offsetting to people seeking clear, concise answers. It makes it difficult for the borderlands historian to cross over into the world of policymaking. One question that is asked of me from time to time especially from policymakers with whom we partner is, of what value is a historical perspective to the policymaking process? Now this is a reasonable question, but one that's not easily answered, at least in a way that will satisfy non-historians who often have a somewhat cautious view of the relevance of history. John Tosh argues that historical research reminds policymakers that they need to give due diligence to three method methodological issues, questions of context, the study of process, and questions of difference. Much but not all of the policy literature on borders that I have read only pays lip service to the history of borderlands. Historical data are collected but are often not analyzed or interpreted by historical scholars. The data, the data that are gathered are most often that of the recent past from which policymakers can draw information on antecedent conditions that immediately preceded the current developments they are considering. So how do we elevate the position of historical scholarship in border policy making? I have four suggestions. The first is that borderlands historical scholars need to partner and network with borderland scholars from other disciplines who, because of their shared interest in understanding the changing nature of borders and borderlands, are more likely to champion the inclusion of historical scholars in social science research. I think we've done this in big. Secondly, it's important for scholars of borderlands history to bring their historical studies of past borderlands up to the present. This will help us deal with a concern often expressed about the relevance of history to present conditions. Borderlands historians also need to speak to the present and draw out general ideas from the work and communicate them in policy terms. Thirdly, practitioners of borderlands history must continue to remind policymakers that the role of historical analysis in policy is less about specific policy goals and more about perspective. Policymakers need to be constantly reminded that policies developed for contemporary geopolitics or to manage contemporary issues in the borderlands do not stay confined to the present. While contemporary border issues are rooted in past institutional interactions among nation states, they have also been shaped by changing historical geographical circumstances that are unique to discrete cross-border regions. A historical geographical perspective broadens the discussion around specific policies and has the potential to help policymakers find common ground. Finally, 
A historical perspective allows for a more in-depth consideration of the argument that we are now entering a period of post-globalization, which some liken to a past where nation-states ruled supreme. The rise of populism, the re-emergence of protectionism, and the potential return of state-centric borders amidst ongoing globalization are viewed as evidence of such a direction, leading many to ask if this path will result in a new kind of normal. The historical perspective, however, situates current trends within a long-term perspective, which emphasizes that while borders are ubiquitous, they are also both similar and different in form and function because of different histories and geographies. Such a perspective also reminds us that borders and the borderlands in which they are situated constantly change, and that they both configure and are reconfigured by globalization, which is also an evolving process. As a concept, globalization can be viewed and used as an independent variable to explain changes in borders. However, at the same time, we have to realize that changes in borders and resultant positions of nation states can in turn impact globalization. History shows us that periods of accelerated globalization are often followed by periods of deglobalization. Such an understanding suggests that we should not be surprised by current developments, that we should plan for such occurrences, and that as border specialists we should develop theories and methods that are sensitive to basic precepts such as scale, territory, motion, sovereignty, and the continuity-discontinuity paradox that inform the strategies we develop. Perhaps such an understanding might also help us develop a new paradigm which avoids the extreme positions that dominate different historical periods and encourages us to focus on governance strategies which recognize the historical coexistence of paradoxes in political economic ideologies and the resultant power imbalances. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Randy. So we've got a couple questions. And um, hey there. Um, so uh, that was really interesting. Thank you for that. And I think, like, I'm on board with with your argument here. Like, um, yeah, it's really really exciting to think through all this literature. Um, but I was just wondering, uh, how do you think? How can you kind of think borders and borderlands together, um, like in the contemporary context? And not this is an entirely new context, but you know when. For example, you live in Dublin or you live in Vancouver, and when you're trying to leave, go to the US, you encounter the US border in your hometown as you're kind of flying out, right? It's like, it's not, you know, what is the borderland in that sense, right? At the mm -hmm. airport, um, how do you kind of, you know, do you expand the concept of borderland to include those sort of spaces or what, like how does that, or you know, a, or a borderland sort of being disappeared or a face, like how would you, um, see that because you can see why people might not think much about borderlands when they're usually encountering borders kind of in the in an airport context yes. or something, but they don't they don't see a borderland, right? So that's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, well, that's why I am arguing that scale is important, and scale changes as technologies change. I mean, I think that the airport is a perfect example of a liminal kind of space or borderland because the air, the airport is a very different place now than it was when I started traveling many many years ago. Uh, it's it's a place of, uh, of, of of frustration for many people. It's a place of security. It's a place of instability. It's not a place of happiness where people are traveling. You know, it, it's something we all go through. And 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 so when I say that borderlands can narrow to become not much more than lines or expand to become huge regions, that reflects changes, changes in technology, changes in governance, changes. In everything for security, for example, now there's the re the bordering takes place before you even get to the airport. You've got to go through these pre stages of security in many countries, right? So that that's what I'm saying is that uh, 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 that history, I think, prepares us for understanding that these changes are not unique to a specific time and place. It's a, it's an ongoing evolution, and uh, it's an organic kind of thing, I guess. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Uh, thank that you. I'm looking forward to reading the paper. Um, my question may be a, a slightly difficult one, and, and maybe I've misunderstood some, some parts of this, but I, I wonder in what sense this is under-theorised, because I've sitting through 45 minutes of this discussion, it doesn't strike me as an absence of theory. In fact, there's a great deal of theory. You've sort of gone through a lot of it. So I wonder to what sense you think it's under-theorised and relative to what? 
because it strikes me looking at border studies and migration studies across disciplines, mm -hmm. there's a real absence of empirical work. Mm -hmm. So actually, relating to the second question, we have very poor understanding of what actually happens at airports, either in terms of the experience of people moving through them mm -hmm. or how they're arranged from a legal governance sense. And what I see when I look at the landscape of this is a lot of theory and not a lot of empirical work. Yeah. And what empirical work there is tends to be what you might disparagingly describe as anecdotal sociology. There's essentially <laughs> sociologists and criminologists saying, I went to the airport and I saw this. Yeah. And it confirms my beliefs based on this theory. So the example that was given, many sociologists go through airports. If they're detained, they experience an agamben moment. Mm -hmm. They have their moment where the sovereign power is laid bare to them as they see it, they're in this liminal space, and that becomes the base of an article or a conversation about how airports operate, yeah. rather than understanding how, from an institutional perspective, discretion works, yeah. what the law in that particular situation is, how the interagency relationships work. So yeah. I'm just wondering, is it under-theorised relative to our empirical understanding, or is it under-theorised relative to some other metric that we might be I'm using? arguing it's under-theorised in historical work. Okay. In contemporary work, it may be even over-theorized. Uh, the problem in the, the, is because of it's like a Tower of Babel. Different disciplines attack it from, a, from a, their own vocabulary, their own concepts. And so the challenge is to try to learn to talk to each other and, and develop common, well not common, but uh, uh, develop kind of approaches, concepts, and theories that, that we can all sort of contribute to and understand on a common mutual basis. And I agree with you. I mean. Uh, uh, all you have to do, I think the most exciting work in border theorizing is outside the social sciences, actually. It's in the humanities. And uh, well, Victor will, will talk that better than I can. Um, but you're quite right. I mean, but I'm talking about in history, there has been a tendency to emphasize the empirical at the expense of the theoretical. And I, I see Michelle Nine has said, and he's a historian, so I think he agrees with me. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Randy, I was just thinking, and actually in response to your fr the first question, um, you know, I wonder if you can reflect on the way that just the events of the past, the, 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 the past few decades, you know, um, outside of your own work, how those have affected your own scholarship, just <laughs> reflecting on, you know, for that, the, your, your book on migration across the Great Lakes borderlands. If you were to return to right to that now, yeah. right that now, um, how how that would look different in in the context of, of all those uh, yeah. circumstances that you described towards the end of your uh, the end of your talk? That's an excellent question. When I wrote that book, and that was it stemmed from my my PhD dissertation, so it goes right back to the late seventies. It was a two volume massive piece of work. Uh, I didn't think about borderlands very much at all because. Uh, you know, it just wasn't in the, in the literature. It was a nation-state-centered kind of historical literature that I was looking at. But towards the end of writing this, I began to reflect on on what it, not just what it meant to cross a border, but what it meant for places uh, that were received and lost migrants. And I started to think about the ties that are connect, uh, particularly the Canada-U.S. border. That migration, unlike the European to North American border, which meant a disassociation, a cutting off of connections, it didn't necessarily mean that. So there is this cross-border thing. So then I begin to think about, well, what does the border mean? Uh, and, and, and actually, uh, I got fairly good reviews, but one critic slammed me for calling, and called me a nationalist because I dared to reflect uh, about border, bordering and, and these kinds of terms. And, and that was the state of the history at that early Period. So that just pissed me off, and I decided to, <laughs> to keep going on with this. And then I had my epiphany when I saw this debate, and uh, and uh, and then I saw uh, a, an infrastructure being created. And so I was quite excited to get involved with the, with the, the big project because that allowed me to further develop these ideas. So, yeah. But I did feel very much alone 30 years ago, for sure. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, I was very uh, interested in the uh, link to policy development and how uh, scholars and uh, those uh, involved in policy development uh, can uh, work together. Uh, and I'm wondering if you have any um, uh, 
suggestions uh, or any views about the types of research uh, that uh, at the policy level that we need to be doing uh, yeah. for those of us in government? That's a good question. Uh, if we look at the was it the PRI final report? If you look at uh, the way they did their research, they basically looked at the five. I think they defined five cross-border regions, and they interviewed in total about 200 people. And who did they interview? Government people, think tanks, people, uh, 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 a few scholars, uh, NGOs. And from that very limited sample, they made some grandiose conclusions. Uh, and for example, in Atlantic Canada, they, they might have interviewed eight or ten different groups, but the only person who they quoted was Brian Crowley, who was the, uh, who was the uh, uh, organizer for the Atlantic Institute Market Studies. Well, who did he represent? He represented a neoliberal think tank. So you've got to be very careful. You've got you to make sure that you're inclusive. And I see a lot of policy uh, making the same mistakes. They're not inclusive enough. Now, I think in being inclusive, you've got to bring in uh, people who, are at the, uh, who do history at, the, at more of the ground roots level. Um, who recognize that there isn't a borderland. There are several borderlands, and even within those borderlands, there are several discrete units. So within, again, Atlantic Canada, I would argue that Madawaska is a unique borderland, and it's, it, it, to me it's almost the, 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 the perfect example of a borderland, while the rest of Atlantic Canada is, is, is not. I mean, uh, it's just not. Newfoundland is way different than, than Nova Scotia, which is way different and Maine is different than Massachusetts. They're just different. So you've got to be very careful when you make policies uh, on a grander scale. And I think history is, reflects that. And history and geography makes that, uh, emphasizes that, that, that argument, I think. So. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Question right up here. Oh, I knew you'd have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to follow up on, on the point that was made about, uh, about theory and theory being developed uh, by different disciplines, as, as, uh, as Randy has uh, alluded to. Uh, this is one of the big challenges in border studies because of the cross-disciplinary nature of it and the fact that all of the disciplines come to the development of border theory from very different perspectives results in uh, discontinuities in the, in the way in which these, these theories mesh with each other. And uh, a number of us have been grappling with, uh, with that, that, that particular issue. How do we come up with, with some common talking points about theory? Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've discovered uh, in just doing a bit of a liter literature research and in some work I was doing on uh, the basis of uh, belonging and how, how people develop a sense of belongingness, is I, I uh, encountered literature in social uh, and cultural psychology, which I had never been aware of, where psychologists are actually quoting border studies people about understandings of the border. And uh, what they've done, because they're more science-oriented, is they've gone back to basics in uh, topology. So they're looking at it from a theoretical, topological perspective uh, based upon uh, some uh, philosophical and uh, mathematical constructs of, of borders <coughs> and borderlands. And this suggests to me that we, as social scientists and and people in the humanities should perhaps uh, not necessarily embrace that perspective, but at least see what's coming out of, of that approach. And the social psychologists are very new to, to border studies. So I, I think there's a dialogue necessary. And one of the things that I intend to do is to try to bring some of these people together with social science and, and humanities scholars so that we can, we can start uh, looking for some common ground. I don't know if you want to comment on that. No. <laughs> I agree. Question in the back. Thank you, Randy. You're welcome, Yusi. Um, enjoyed it a lot. Um, 
you you said in in response to the question that was made uh, regarding the theory and, and, and the the fact or the uh, uh, perception that maybe border studies is giving over theorized at, at the moment uh, and and I would like to follow up on on that mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that it's exactly the case and I'm wondering if there's something that we could take from your historical analysis that would help us to go go through the current era in border studies where I really feel that the the very borders of border studies are getting increasingly fuzzy mm -hmm. which is generally speaking a good thing mm -hmm. right uh, building on what Victor just said yeah. but in terms of uh, theory building there has been problems uh, at least in, in my reading uh, because the space of border studies is, is so fuzzy and so broad that rather than really critically discussing or challenging some of the theoretical uh, ideas, we simply tend to create our own theory. They're yeah. like, I'm, okay, yeah, you work yeah. on that, yeah. but you know, this is what I do. And I'm guilty of that. And there's very, very little yep. critical theoretical discussion. And, and maybe hence also the actual application of these theories in, into, into practice. Yep. That is why we don't have that many empirical yep. uh, studies. Uh, yep. And what I mean is that the, we, the amount of knowledge we have keeps on expanding and expanding, but it doesn't accumulate. Yeah. I mean, now, okay, you keep working on your stuff and I do mine and we both work on the same things and I don't challenge you and you don't challenge me and yeah. you know, that's, that's fine. But, but the, I feel like that's one of the biggest problems in border studies, why, why we don't have that kind of major talking points yeah. in the field. Yeah. But did you see that in, from your historical, like you went through a, a lot of stuff there, would, would there be something to be learned uh, for the current uh, situation? Or are we just facing a, a different conundrum? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, mean the, the, I think right now we're in a transitional stage. I mean, with borderlands, when the borderlands, uh, uh, approach was the more modern borderlands approach was developed it was it was so we had something that we could frame our research and that was of course the a territory the borderless world hypothesis and we could all just consider that but what's occurred in the last recent past is that a lot of that argument is is shown to be somewhat spurious and so we're trying to come up with a new paradigm so the exciting challenge we have now is to develop a new paradigm. We've got to figure out a new way to approach borders. But I would argue, because and I'm biased, that history prepares us better to do that. But you're absolutely right. We all like are in our little vacuums and we develop our own theories. My spatial grammar thing, I mean, I, I have a 1,400-page manuscript where I try to develop those arguments with empirical work. And that's what you need to do. You have to have a balance. But in terms of the different disciplines com coming together and, and, and develop a more common perspective, I guess that's, I think that's what you're talking about. I don't, I don't, I don't see, uh, uh, I don't have in my head at least, I'm retired now, so, <laughs> but I don't have in my head uh, 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 an answer for that. I do think, though, that I think uh, history and culture, which I think is traditionally being, well, history, which has been ignored, can contribute to this, and I hope someone picks up, takes the the ball and runs with that. Um, but you're absolutely right. How do we how do we come together? How do we how do we change the Tower of Babel and actually develop a framework, a common ground? And uh, I'll leave it to young scholars like yourself and old scholars like him. <laughs> Either questions? If not, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Randy again for getting uh, getting us started, uh, really launching this conversation uh, so deeply and thoroughly. So thank you very much for your thank comments you. as well. Questions? Thanks for questions.